Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome back. Hope everybody had a good weekend. Um, I went to church for like the second time since all of the COVID stuff started and it was outside and it was like, I don't know, it must have been over 80 and I was just sitting in the sun sweating and it was still good. It was good to go to church, but it was kind of painful too. I worked for it. So uh, hopefully you had a good weekend. Um, any homework questions? So today, uh, arc length is due, correct? Then um, on Wednesday, surface area will be due. And then next Monday, the physical application section will be due. Now, after the physical application section is when we typically take our first exam in this course. So that means that our first exam will be next week. Okay. So just so that you get that kind of in your head that uh, sometime next week, probably on Wednesday of next week. But of course, I'll have to think about it a little bit since not everybody's in here at the same time. So we might actually have to do two days of exam day, but we'll all get that taken care of by Wednesday. And I'll let everybody know on Wednesday what the plan is for exams. Does that sound good? Uh, but yeah, so plan on probably since the homework is due on Wednesday, I would probably make the exam kind of a Wednesday, Friday thing next week. Sounds the most reasonable to me right now. So that's probably what we'll do. So in class, Wednesday, Friday, and I'll kind of send, like, let you know soon which come at which time. Sound good? Okay, very good. Uh, what questions can I answer for you? Yes. Um, for 23, for 22, 23, 27, how are we supposed to approximate On which section? For uh, section 6.5. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, how are you supposed to approximate those? Yeah, it depends on your calculator. So, uh, I don't care. So, if at the end of the day you just want to enter in the, if you have like a TI-89 and you just plug it in and it gives you the answer, it's like, hooray, you did it. That's fine. If you have something else where it's like you could graph the curve and then you sometimes they have an area estimator under the curve that works. Uh, however, your calculator does it best is fine with me. You could type it into Wolfram Alpha. That works. Whatever you need to do. So I don't really care as much about that part of it. The setting up is much more important to me. But do something so you can see. Yeah, I can do something and figure these out. <clears throat> Other questions? Yes. So on the test, would you, you wouldn't like have those? No. Uh, in fact, there won't be calculators allowed on the test. So anything that I give you on the test, I would expect you could do it all by yourself. Yeah. For sure. Yes. Uh -huh. How, how slight are we talking? Um, I think it's like if it's like a three point one six, I get like a three point two six. Hmm. Interesting. On uh, like which number? Um, it for me in number twenty-three and number twenty-six. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, one thing you're you're using ln of x and not like log of x, correct? Oh, am I looking at the wrong problem? Yes, I am. I'm looking at the wrong problem. I'm sorry. So, yeah. I mean, just be really careful with your parentheses and stuff. Again, that's why I hate, I don't really enjoy problems very much where you plug it into your calculator. I try not to get very many of them. Every once in a while I give some, but just to make sure you know how to use a calculator, you know what I mean? But ultimately I don't feel it's like that useful that at the end of the day, you plug it into a calculator and get something. What I would say is use a different piece of technology like 
go to Wolfram Alpha or something, plug it in there, see what it gives you. And if it's the same as what you're getting and it's still different from the back of the book, I'd be kind of like, hmm, I wonder if I'm a little bit off. But uh, unfortunately, it's very hard for me without bringing in a calculator and plugging in, in myself to like validate whether or not you were doing right. But I'm welcome. I'm happy to look at it after class if you'd like me to. Other questions? Or anyone online that has a question? Getting easy. <laughs> Have people had the chance to look at um, six point six very much yet? Not much. Okay. So it's actually, uh, it's, it's pretty fun, um, that section on uh, surface area. If you haven't got to see the lecture yet, uh, it's very interesting how you actually compute surface area using like breaking it up into little pieces. And it's very, very similar to computing like arc length. It's almost like you take your arc length and spin it. Okay, in, in fact, that's exactly what it is, is that you take the arc length and spin it. Because if you look at the surface area formula, you get integral, right? And I go through on the lecture on YouTube, I go through all of this in much more detail. But it's interesting that at in the end of the day, uh, the, the formula, if you were just computing arc length, right would be the square root of one plus f prime of x quantity squared dx right that would be that's not surface area but that would be arc length correct and that's what you've been doing on this homework well when you add in um, two pi f of x in front well, in some sense, what you're saying is, if this is, I've got some, here's A, here's B, I've got some function f of x, and I want to know if I spun this thing around the x-axis, something like this, right? If I spun this thing around the x-axis, then what would be the surface area of the shape that I created? Well, it's almost like I take a length, that length, and I spin the length through what shape? A circle. So I take it and I spin it the circumference. So kind of like I stretch it by a length of the circumference. But what's the length of the circumference? Well, 2 pi r. And so I stretch it through a length of 2 pi f of x, but f of x is just the radius of each disk. So I literally take arc length and multiply it by the radius, and then I just get surface area. And so, like, geometrically, it's very, like, satisfying in some sense that you're just taking a length and multiplying it by a width in some sense, and it comes out with exactly what you would think. Um, and of course, proving this, and that's what I do in the lecture, is prove that this is actually true. It's not just as easy as say, see, nice arc length, see, rotate it, it works. It's not quite that simple, but it uh, it's really, really cool. So um, anyway. Uh, maybe that gave you some time to think of a question. Yes, sir. Sure. 
22 on 6.5. Okay, so 6.5, number 22. Oh, this is one of the cal calculator ones. Yeah. Okay, I can help you set it up. Um, so we've got y equals sine of x. Uh, for zero is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to pi. Zero less than or equal to x less than or equal to pi. And we want to find the integral that gives the arc length. Um, okay. So, uh, in this case, our length is going to be equal to zero to pi. Uh, square root 1 plus the derivative of whatever this is. So if y is sine of x, y prime uh, is cosine of x. So I get 1 plus cosine of x quantity squared dx, right? Uh, and so this gets you way there, right? Uh, but not fully. So to actually keep going with this, I think I actually did this one last time, but uh, to keep going with this, we would need a tool that we'll get in the future called uh, trig substitution. We don't have that yet, so that's why they say, and now just use a calculator, plug it in, and get the answer. So this is all you really need for part A. This is the setup. And then to continue, you would need some sort of technology. Yeah. I'm assuming you're not going to have any questions like this. Uh, uh, this specifically. Like this. I I might give you, I could give you this problem and tell you to stop here. So I could give you a problem where I say, here's a function. Show me the integral that would give me the length of the curve. Uh, but then I might say, I would not say to evaluate it if you don't have the tools to evaluate. Yeah. I, I would probably say that on the test, probably the test will be about 10 problems. And eight of them, I'll just ask you to set up the integral. So you won't have to come, go through all the uh, antiderivative and all, maybe seven or eight. I don't want to lock myself into eight exactly. But seven or eight, I'll have you set up. The other ones I'll actually have you compute. It makes it so we could do a little bit more problems in the actual test time. And ultimately, I'm not trying to test you to see, are you really, really good at taking antiderivatives? I really want to know, are you getting good at setting up integrals? That's the tough part. Integration is kind of like, yeah, 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 you can do it. Um, so that's what you should expect. So this kind of problem actually would be very appropriate for the test. I just wouldn't have you evaluate. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, since you're here, I'll at least do one surface area problem just so we can kind of get into the groove of surface area. And uh, so here's the equation that you're going to get out of the lecture. So if you're trying to compute the surface area of some curve that you rotate around the axis, then the surface area, oh, I just wrote it over there, but I'll write it one more time. Uh, integral a to b of 2 pi f of x square root 1 plus f prime of x quantity squared dx. And one thing that a couple people have asked me, and maybe I'll just tell you all right now, it's like, do you expect us to actually know all of these formulas for the first exam? And the easy answer is yes, uh, I do. And the nice thing, though, is that they actually do make sense. Okay, like the disk method, it's like, well, what's the area of a disk? Uh, well, it's pi r squared. It's like, oh, that's what goes in the integral. What's the area of the outside of its cylinder? 2 pi r h. Oh, well, that's the shell method. 
right? What's now arc length? Eh. Arc length, you just have to remember that one. You know, uh, square root of one plus uh, f prime of x squared. That one isn't just like obvious. But uh, then once you know that one, surface area makes a lot of sense because it's just the arc length times the circumference of the circle. And so if you kind of start to think about these equations geometrically, it's not that hard to remember the formula. So I would prefer that. And then like when you get to calculus three or we just get a little further down the road in this class and it's like, compute the surface of revolution when you spin this thing around the x-axis. It's not kind of like, oh, geez, how do you do the washer method? I forget. You just are like, oh yeah, washer method, let's go. So I want you to learn the formulas just for your own ease of use in the future. Uh, it makes life better. I guarantee you that. Okay. Uh, so let's look at an, a problem. Let's do one that's relatively fun. So let's try number 17. So we've got y equals one fourth of e to the two x plus e to the minus two x or negative two is less than or negative two is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to two about the x-axis. Okay, so this is our function. We look at the surface area formula and right off the bat you can see we are going to need the derivative. Right, so it might be nice to take the derivative here uh, it depends on how you kind of want to write this out. If you don't mind the one fourth just being there, it's fine. If you want to multiply the one fourth through before you take the derivative, that's fine. Uh, let's just leave it there for now. So y prime would be equal to the one fourth just stays and I'll take the derivative of the other piece. Uh, but what is the derivative of e to the two x? 2e to the 2x, yeah, the 2 comes down from the chain rule, so I get 2e to the 2x. And then here, the negative 2 comes down, so I get minus 2e to the minus 2x. Okay, now, if you wanted to distribute that and get rid of some stuff, you could say that this is e to the 2x divided by 2, minus, uh, let's see, so there's going to be a 2 on the bottom, and it's e to the minus 2x over 2. It depends on, if that's a good place for you to work with negative exponents, that's fine. If not, you could change it, but you could write this as 1 over 2e to the 2x. everybody agree uh, because I could move this negative exponent to the bottom of the fraction and write it that way sometimes this is more helpful you can just visualize things better sometimes not uh, let me move over here and we will set this thing up so I know what my function is this is f of x I know what my derivative is this is my f prime of x. So let's start plugging things in. So I get that the surface area is equal to the integral from negative 2 to 2 of 2 pi times my function. And in this case, my function is sitting right here, this 1 fourth. So I get 1 fourth times e to the 2x plus e to the minus 2x. Okay, so that's the 
f of x times the square root of 1 plus the derivative, which I just said was e to the 2x over 2 minus 1 over 2e to the 2x quantity squared dx. So far, so good. Uh, maybe not, right, when you look at it, but uh, it's, there's some things to do. First thing I see, though, is that I have this 2 and the 4 on the bottom, so that's 1 half, and the 1 half could come outside the integral. Also, the pi could come outside the integral, so let's just pull all of the constants out. So I still have the integral from minus 2 to 2. Oh, sorry, I wanted to write these constants out here. Uh, so I get one half of a pi on the outside. Inside, I have this guy sitting there, e to the 2x uh, plus e to the minus 2x times the square root of 1 plus. Okay, and now I want to do a little bit of work. I want to square this thing. Uh, and remember, this is really just a minus b squared, right? So I want to take the first one squared, and then 2 times the first times the second, and then the second one squared. So the first one squared, so what's e to the 2x squared? Yeah, e to the 4x, and then 2 squared is 4. So this would be e to the 4x over 4. Sound good? Then I get 2 times this first guy. What's 2 times e to the 2x over 2? Just e to the 2x, and then I need to multiply that by negative 1 over 2e to the 2x. So if I multiply this guy by e to the 2x, what do I get? Negative 1 half. That's right, negative one half. So this is minus a half, agreed? Then I want to square this guy. So what's the square of negative one half with e to the two x on the bottom? So if I'm squaring it, it's positive. And then one squared on top is still one. On the bottom, squaring the two is four. Squaring the e to the 2x is e to the 4x dx. And now a really cool thing happens. And if you've watched all the, um, the pr example problems over the arc length section, this trick came up before. Uh, and that is, notice here I have a 1, and here I have a minus 1 half. Add those together and I get positive one half. So let's rewrite really quick. So I get one half pi integral from negative two to two of e to the two x plus e to the negative two x times the square root of e to the four x over four plus one half plus one over four e to the 4x dx. Now, that seems sort of horrible, but the question that I want to ask at this point is, wouldn't it be wonderful if this, what's inside of this square root, were just something squared? Right? And we even have a hint, because to get this guy, I squared something and it had a negative one half. The only difference here is now I have a positive one half. So that might give me a clue to how it might factor. So let me rewrite this and see if you agree with what I said. So this is one half pi integral from minus two to two of e to the two x plus e to the minus two x times the square root of now, What's the square 
square root of e to the 4x over 4. e to the 2x over 2. What's the square root of 1 over 4 e to the 4x? Yeah, 1 over 2 e to the 2x. And let's say I put a plus sign in between them and squared it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that were true? Well, let's see. What's this guy squared? That guy. What's this guy squared? This guy. And then the only other thing is 2 times this one times this one. So 2 times this one is e to the 2x times this one is 1 half, which is exactly what's sitting right here. So this is exactly right. And so now I can take the square root of the square. Let's do it. When I do, I still have one half pi sitting on the outside. I haven't even thought about integrating yet. I'm just trying to simplify at this point. Then I have e to the 2x plus e to the negative 2x. And then in here, I just square rooted the square. And so I get times e to the 2x over 2 plus 1 over 2 e to the 2x dx. And now we could sort of like foil that, right? Foil it out and uh, get something that we might be able to work with. So we get 1 half pi, negative 2 to 2, Okay, e to the 2x times e to the 2x over 2 is e to the 4x over 2. Then I'll multiply this one by this one. e to the 2x divided by e to the 2x is just 1, so I just get plus 1 half. Then I have e to the negative 2x, or otherwise known as 1 over e to the 2x, times this guy would just give me plus 1 half. And then this one times this one, remember this is 1 over e to the 2x, times a 1 over e to the 2x times 2 is plus 1 over 2 e to the 4x. dx. Pretty close to being ready to integrate. I still have 1 half pi integral from negative 2 to 2 of e to the 4x over 2 plus 1 plus 1 over 2 e to the 4x dx and now we're ready to take the antiderivative <laughs> okay so we get 1 half pi antiderivative of e to the 4x over 2 Remember when I take the antiderivative of e to the something, I divide by the thing. So it's still going to be e to the 4x, but I divide by the 4, which gives me 8 on the bottom. So I get e to the 4x over 8. Antiderivative of 1 is x. And then the antiderivative of, this is e to the negative 4x. So if I take the antiderivative, I'll divide by a negative 4. I get minus 1 over 8 e to the 4 x. Or if you would prefer, you could put it on top as e to the negative 4 x. Whatever makes more sense to you. And we're going from negative 2 to 2. Let's plug things in. Get. We still have one half pi here, and now let's plug in two. When I plug in two, I get e to the eight over eight, e to the eight over eight. Then I plug in two and I get plus two. Then I get minus one over eight e to the eight, minus one over eight e to the eight. Okay, all of that minus we plug in minus 2. 
So I get e to the negative 8 over 8, e to the minus 8 over 8. Um, oh, well, let's write that differently because it might get confusing to us. So for 1 over 8, e to the 8th, correct? If I plug in minus 2 here, I get minus 2. And then finally, minus 1 over 8, e to the negative 8, which would make it go up to the top as a positive 8. So it's minus e to the 8 over 8. Okay. Which is equal to we have our 1 half pi. Now let's start adding some things together. Uh, I have an e to the 8th over 8 minus minus e to the 8th over 8. So that's plus another e to so 2 e to the 8 over 8 or e to the 8th over 4. We get 2 minus minus 2 or plus 2. So we get 2 plus 2 is 4. And then finally I get negative 1 over 8 e to the 8 minus 1 over 8 e to the 8. So that's minus 2 of those or the other way I can write that is minus 1 over 4 e to the 8. And to do really better than that is very hard uh, with, without a calculator. Uh, I suppose I could multiply through by 1 half pi, but it doesn't really seem like it's much more understandable. So you get something like this. Yes? Okay, so going back to the surface area, the whole switching from f prime of x squared Right here. So kind of going from here to here to here to here. Right. So we like Um. Not that I know of. And uh, in fact, like the function has to be extremely special for this to work. So like if I gave you just a random, if I made up a random function and said, find the surface area when you spin this function, it won't work. Like in, in, it will work, you just won't be able to compute it using the tools we have right now. So it kind of takes a very special function to get out of the square root. But this is like one of the tricks that could work to get you out of the square root. Uh, so I don't think that there's any really nice way to visualize it. Uh, I mean, actually, I think it's easier to visualize algebraically than it is to visualize it geometrically. Because in this case, you kind of have like a, an a minus b squared. And what you do is this is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Or I guess you could say minus 2ab, so to speak. And then it's kind of like once you add the 1, now this became a positive 2ab. And so then it factors back down to a nice thing, and everything's wonderful. So if this happens, it's like, yay for us. Typically, it does not. So if I just made up a random problem for surface area, it would be a disaster. Um, so surface area is very complicated. And so finding antiderivatives for surface area problems are typically hard. Yeah. Do you know who created that function? This particular problem? No, I don't. I wish it was me, but <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> So you can see that surface area problems 
the function was, I even erased it now, but it was this guy, right? Basically, this was our f of x. He looks so innocent, right? The little innocent function here, but you can see that in surface area problems, that can create quite a bit of algebra. So, yeah. Again, if I were giving an exam and I said to set up the integral, how many lines would it take? One, right? This is the answer right here. If I was just saying set up the surface area problem, if I ask you to evaluate it, it takes a few more lines. Yeah. Uh, Same section? Yeah. 14? Okay, so fourteen is X equals the square root of negative y squared plus 6y minus 8 um, for th 3 is less than or equal to y less than or equal to 7 halves um, and about the y-axis. Okay. So it's in the right form to rotate around the y-axis right now. But I do need to know what the derivative is. Uh, and so I need to find what is x prime in this case. And so I need to take the derivative of this guy. I guess I need to use a chain rule. This is all of that quantity to the 1 half power. So bring down the 1 half and I get 1 half negative y squared plus 6y minus 8 to the negative 1 half times the derivative of what's inside, which is minus 2y plus 6. Now, that's really ugly, so we could probably do a little bit better uh, in terms of simplification. And so, notice there's a 2 on bottom, and both of these things has to have a 2 on top. So I could cancel the 2 with this guy to get a 1 and this guy to get a 3. So I could write on top that's really not very nice how I simplified, but it, it'll work. Uh, so this is minus y plus 3 on top. And on the bottom, I have the square root of negative y squared plus 6y minus 8. So this is my x prime, and this is my x. Does everybody feel good about that? or at least believe me. Okay, um, so let's set up the integral then. One thing I have to say about calculus too is like, I've been doing calculus too for a very long time, but I remember as a student, like there isn't quite very many times in your life that you feel smarter than when you solve a really nasty integral like this. It's just like, man. I've got what it takes. It's like, <laughs> so it's a good feeling. Like uh, there is something like rewarding about from calculus about doing problems like this. So uh, enjoy it. Uh, so we need to set this up. We have surface area is equal to integral. Uh, we're going from three to seven halves of uh, two pi f of x, two pi f of x is my original, and that's right here. So, or f of y in this case. So I have square root of negative y squared plus 6y minus 8, okay, times the square root of 1 plus the derivative. Here's the derivative, right? Quantity squared. So that's going to be negative y plus 3 
divided by the square root of negative y squared plus 6y minus 8, that thing, whole thing, quantity squared dy. Okay, again, it looks sort of bad, but uh, I think it will be okay. What's going to help us here is we're squaring that. So we're going to get rid of that square root that's on the bottom, and that's good for us. So let's square that little term first and not worry much about the rest. The 2 pi can come out of the integral, and then I still have integral for 3 to 7 halves. 2 pi came out, I still have this square root. So I have square root of negative y squared plus 6y minus 8. Okay, and now we want to deal with squaring this. Uh, so I still have the square root of 1 plus. So if I square the top, I get negative y squared is y squared. Negative, and then I take 2 times the first times the second. So 2 times negative y times 3 is minus 6y. And then I want to square the 3, which is 9, all over the bottom squared. But the square of that square root is minus y squared plus 6y minus 8 dy. Still looks a little nasty, but now I can get a common denominator for these two because 1 is otherwise known as this thing divided by itself. Correct? So I could write it this way. 2y, I'll write this part fast, integral. 3 to 7 halves, square root minus y squared plus 6y minus 8 times. Okay, square root of. This thing becomes a fraction that's just this denominator over itself. And so on top I get minus y squared plus 6y minus 8. Uh, and then all of that plus y squared minus 6y plus 9. All of that's going to be over minus y squared plus 6y minus 8. So is everybody good with how I got a common denominator? So far so good? Okay, now some wonderful things happen. I have a minus y squared and a y squared, they cancel. I have a 6y and a minus 6y, they cancel. I have a 9 and a minus 8, that becomes a 1. That's not the worst thing I've ever seen. Uh, so let's see what happens now. So this is equal to... 2 pi integral from 3 to 7 over 2. I have this square root, square root minus y squared plus 6y minus 8. Okay, now we need to simplify this down a little bit. On top, I have 9 minus 8, which is 1. And then I'm taking the square root of 1. What's the square root of 1? One. So I'm just going to say times on top we have one. On bottom we have the square root of this stuff. Right? So it's the square root of minus y squared plus 6y minus 8 dy. Life is wonderful. Right? And we get to cancel some things. And we end up with 2 pi integral from 3 to 7 over 2 of what's inside now? 1. one. I like that. 1 dy. I can do this one. Uh, this is 2 pi. Antiderivative of 1 is what? Technically y, right? Uh, so it's y evaluated from 3 to 7 halves. So I still have 2 pi. 
Uh, now I plug things in and I get plugging in seven halves, I get seven halves. Minus plugging in three, I get three, which is six halves. So seven halves minus six halves is two pi times one half, which is So my suggestion after seeing a few of these problems, there might be like inward groaning going on to the algebra involved in these problems. What I would suggest to you is take it slow. Don't try to do like 15 steps at once. That is just like the killer of algebra. It is like, you know what? I am really a lot better than Dr. Willis at this. Uh, and it's like, I can do like three steps at once. I won't make an error. I don't even do that. And the reason I don't do that is because I'll make an error. Like it's so easy to like miss one negative sign and then it's just like it's all gone. And like for some of this stuff to work, it has to be perfect, right? Like it has to exactly equal one so I can take the square root of one and just get one on top. It has to be exactly the same here and here to cancel and so one little minus sign error and the whole thing just kind of goes haywire. So you have to be very, very careful in your algebra. The other thing that I would suggest, especially to those of you and you know who you are, who are small writers, like you have little tiny chicken scratch writing and you could like fit like a, you know, a PhD dissertation on like a front and back of a piece of paper kind of thing. That's not that great for this kind of algebra. It's okay to spread your work out more and maybe take more paper. That's good because it's easier to see what you're doing. Uh, and it's so easy to like one plus sign turning into a minus sign could ruin your whole day. And it's always a bummer when comes, somebody comes to me and it's like, I don't know where I went wrong on this thing. And I'm like, doo, 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 doo. there, that minus sign became a plus sign. That was it. And the work was so small, it was very hard to tell the difference between the minus and the plus. So my, everyone is capable of doing this problem. You just have to take your time and only try to do one thing at a time. Don't try to do like three. It, it would be easy for somebody to say, oh, I can do this and to here. It's hard, okay? It's doable, you can do it, but it's very hard and it's very easy to make mistakes. So just be careful. Okay, that's a great place to end for today. You've got a couple of these surface area problems under your belt. Hopefully that will give you the tools you need to do your homework. Uh, so like I said, as a reminder, this homework will be due Wednesday. The next section's homework will be due Monday. So on uh, this Wednesday, we'll probably be talking about this homework. And then Friday and Monday, we'll be talking about the next homework. Okay, and then the next Wednesday and Friday, we'll be taking our first exam. Sound good? All right, have a great day. See you on Wednesday.